Hello, my friends, hello, and welcome once again to Stately Vaughn Manor, where we're going to be talking classics today. You know, it's all high class over here at Stately Vaughn Manor, on account of us being so stately and all. And do you have your fancy pants on, Roger? We're talking the classics. Roger, he doesn't even have any pants on. Of course I've got pants on. <laughs> anyway... We're talking classics today, and I thought of the topic for this particular video a while back. I've been thinking about this subject anyway, and I read this book, or at least, yeah, I pretty much read everything in this book. So, yeah, I read this book a while back. This is the Penguin Classics book, and I went all through it when this book first came out. And this is a book which just talks about all the many Penguin classics that exist. There is a book called the Penguin Modern Classics. That is its companion. I made videos on both of those books. But there's a section in the back of this book called The Vaults. And it's this particular section that made me think of this particular topic. Allow me to read you this little paragraph here. These pages display some of the Penguin Classics titles that are no longer in print. Titles go out of print and drop off the list for the prosaic reason that low sales figures don't justify the cost of another print run. But each time one title falls away, it raises interesting questions. It implies that the way we remember literature is subject to change, that a classic may not always be. A classic. That each title is required to maintain its position. It's like a battle to the death for classic literature. They're always fighting to maintain position, apparently. Anyway, as an author's star wanes, their marginal works might be pruned. Equally, a concerted cultural effort to champion or rehabilitate an author might lead to more of their works appearing or reappearing in the series. The list requires constant tending, weeding, grafting, and replanting. And as editors of the series, we might conclude with Candide that the most we can hope to do is cultivate our garden. So, this is a bunch of books that Penguin discontinued, you know, on account of them cultivating their garden and all that. So, this is a bunch of out-of-print classics, and Penguin is implying that, you know, some classics, they might not always be classics. Maybe we considered them classics at one time, and, you know, they stopped selling, so they're not classics anymore. I guess that's what makes a book a classic, you know, how much they sell. Apparently. Now, some of the books here on these pages, there's a few pages of these. Yeah, there's six pages of these. And some of them, you know, they're anthologies of different things. Like, you've got the anthology of Japanese literature. That was discontinued. The Greek anthology was discontinued. Medieval Latin lyrics... You know, you'd think that would sell like hotcakes, but apparently not. Women's Indian Captivity Narratives. Yeah, I can see how that wouldn't fly so well today. You know, there are different reasons. But, you know, there are some things that kind of stand out on this list, like Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery. Booker T. Washington, sorry, man, you didn't sell well enough. You're not a classic anymore. And, you know, some other stuff. And it's, there's just, it's interesting. Like, Ovid's in here with the Poems of Exile, which, you know, is kind of important. And I suppose, I, I am assuming Oxford publishes the Poems in Exile, Ovid's poems while, that he wrote while he was in exile. That's pretty important stuff. Definitely a classic. I don't care how badly it's sold. It's definitely a classic. And uh, here's one that I've got. I've talked about this before, how it's 
this was discontinued from Penguin, this is the Prisoner of Zenda. However, Oxford still does make a classics edition of this, as so does Wordsworth, I think. So while Penguin might have gotten rid of it, you know, on account of weeding their garden and all, some other Peng some some other classics reprints houses still do consider this a classic. Now, it all does make you wonder though. It is it is a thought. What does make a classic? And do some classics, you know, just suddenly stop becoming classics? And, you know, what are classics anyway? You know, one time when I was younger, I when I was really young, actually, I was probably 15 or 16, I went to a bookstore that I had never gone to before. It was in San Francisco or someplace far away, you know, for me when I was a kid. And there was a section called Classics, and I went right to it, you know, hoping to find, like, Treasure Island or something, you know, something cool like that. And instead, it was a bunch of stuff like this, only not in this edition, but they, they had a bunch of stuff like this, the Greek and Roman Classics, because at one time... That's what classics were. They were the Greek and Roman classics. And those were classics. And it was like that for a long time. That's what the classics were considered to be. And eventually, though, things changed. And we started to consider some literature from Europe and America as classics as well. So, over time, we came up with as a culture, different books that came to be considered class classics. Mostly because they stood the test of time and because of the quality of the books themselves. Mostly, but also, even if the books were not of high quality, for example, they might have been culturally significant. They could have been important in some way and that made them classics. But it is interesting to think about classics, you know, if they stop being read and they're forgotten, are they still classics? This one has, not that one, that one's still remembered, but this one, The Prisoner of Zenda, is not, has not been entirely forgotten. There are still people who remember The Prisoner of Zenda, and it's still read today, but not nearly as much as it was, say, 50 years ago. 50 years ago, this was a lot better known than it is now. Far fewer people read this book now, which is probably why, you know, Penguin doesn't make it anymore. And it does kind of make you think. There are some books that seem like they're always going to be classics, like no matter what, they're always going to be classics. I'm thinking of books like this. This is War and Peace. This is the ultimate example of a classic, probably. It's gigantic and wonderful, but incredible book, extremely high quality, high quality book. It's very important book. It's great. And it is an acknowledged classic by just about everybody except for one or two people on YouTube. But other than those people, this is acknowledged far and wide as a classic, and it seems like this is something that will always be a classic. There are other books like that. Moby Dick, not always considered a classic, but if, once it was, it seems like the type of book that will always be a classic. It's hard to think of a time when that particular book, for example, will not be considered classic. So it seems like from where we're standing at this point in history, that those these books, like this and Moby Dick, they'll probably always be classics. And those are the type of books, for example, that you'll see in a Signet edition, for example. Signet doesn't... It's, it's a brand, which is, you know, that does the mass market paperbacks. I'm assuming they still do. But, you know, it's a brand that's only going to be printing these, the type of classics usually that, you know, are pretty much always going to be classics. But there are other books. Like, there are those books that were considered classics at one time. Like, The Purple Land. 
or The Purple Land That England Lost. I think that was the earlier title. I think this was published in 1885, and at least when this volume was published, which is pretty old, in cameo classics from Grosset and Dunlap, at the time this book was published, The Purple Land was considered, well, by Grosset and Dunlap at least, as a classic. Now, the only, I've never read this. I'd only heard of it from, I think, one line in Hemingway. That's the only time I'd ever heard of this book. And I do know one person who's read it, which would be uh, Book Time with Ryan. Ryan from Book Time with Ryan read this book. And Steve Donahue, obviously, since he's read everything in the universe, has probably read this book. But I don't know anybody else who's read this book, let alone talks about this book. But at one time, at least, it was considered a classic. I don't know any reprint houses that still reprint this. I think the only way you can get, like, a new copy of this is to get a print-on-demand copy. It's one of those books. One of those books that at least at one time was considered a classic and now is not. So is it a classic or is it not a classic? I can't speak to the quality of the work myself since I have not read it. I'm going to, but I have not read it myself. But it's an interesting thought. Is it or is it not a classic? Because it's no longer popular. It's interesting. And, you know, it makes you think about things. There are other books that seem like they're safe, but are they? This is... Henry James, The Golden Bull, and Hen... Oh, Henry James, The Golden Bull. So Henry James, seems like you're, it seems like you're safe, Henry James, but you never know, because do, does anybody actually buy this book anymore? Does anybody read this? I don't know. So is it safe? In 20 or 30 years, will Penguin Classics still be publishing Henry James? The Golden Bowl? Probably. I think this is probably safe. I think most of Henry James' books are safe in the same way that War and Peace probably is, but I'm not certain. It's a question. He could go the same way that fella Trollop seems to be going, but... You never know. Now, there are other books that, you know, probably always should have been considered classics. Lord Dunsany, there is a Penguin edition of Lord Dunsany. How come every reprint house doesn't reprint, like, a lot of Lord Dunsany? If anybody, it seems to me, is a classic author, it's Lord Dunsany. And it, it makes you wonder how things can easily become classics, you know, if they're in the public domain, that helps. But not necessary. You know, there are books like The Lord of the Rings, for example. Most people consider The Lord of the Rings a classic book, I think, at this point, probably. But it's not in the public domain. But the same can go for some works of Hemingway. There are some works of Hemingway that are still not in the public domain. I think most people would consider him a classic author, or at least a very important one. Is his status safe, however? I don't know. But it's weird how choices are made about what becomes a classic or not. Now, it's true, not a heck of a lot of people have heard of Lord Dunsany. So maybe it's the whole popularity thing again. Maybe, you know, it wouldn't sell enough to be considered a classic for other reprint houses to publish Lord Dunsany. But I kind of think they would. I don't know. It's hard to say. Now, there are certain reprint houses that will publish classics where others won't. One author I think that is probably still underrepresented but is very well represented in the Library of America is John O'Hara. He is published in Penguin. I don't know if he's published by Oxford, though. I probably should have checked before I made this video. But I'm wondering, is O'Hara more of an American thing? Like, is he only really considered a classic author in America? If you go to another, if you go to 
Europe or, you know, even, even maybe Britain, is he considered a classic author? I don't know. He's a great, he should be considered a classic author. Library of America certainly considers him so. I don't know. I don't know. So maybe it's, you know, just an American thing for him. But there are other writers that were not considered classics for a long, long time, and now they are, like my good friend H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft, who is now pretty much acknowledged as a classic writer by most, except for the people that are upset by his personal views, you know, on account of him being racist and stuff. But you know what? Does that knock out Jack London? This guy was just as racist, if not more, than Lovecraft. So why does Lovecraft take all the heat on that? I'll tell you what I think. It's because people actually read Lovecraft. Does anybody read Jack London anymore? It's a question. I think Jack London is one of those classic authors who's only known for, say, White Fang and Call of the Wild. And some people still remember he wrote The Sea Wolf, too. But eventually, he's probably only going to be remembered for The Call of the Wild. And that's it. And if they do... Re if other reprint houses do end up reprinting his stuff in, in, in the future, it won't be like this. This is the unabridged Jack London. My fear is that authors like Jack London, who had controversial views, are going to go the way of James Bond, you know, and have their books edited by those helpful editors who, you know, want to make sure none of us are offended. So that, that's one of the things I worry about some classic authors. Like, for example, Jack London, his book, The Call of the Wild, is a book that you see in schools a lot when you're a little kid. Although, he wrote some pretty hardcore tales of survival. I'm a little surprised, actually, he's not read more than he is, Jack London. I don't think it's because of his views, because I don't think many people know about his views. I think it's more that people just don't find his work relevant anymore. His kind of stories of survival and that kind of story, for some reason, not, not read very much. So is Jack London in danger of vanishing in the future? To re be replaced by other classics, for example, that you wouldn't think would ever be classics, like... Thomas Lagodi, Songs of a Dead Dreamer and Grimscribe. This is considered, at least by Penguin, as a classic. Classic from the 80s. Stood the test of time. It's still here from the 80s. Now, I have no problem at all with Lagodi being in the Penguin classics because he is a damn good writer. And it's kind of cool that he's in here. But is he a classic author, really? Is he? In 30 years, will this still be published? Or will it be in the vaults, you know, on account of Penguin weeding their garden? Who's to say? Because this hasn't been around long enough to really stand the test of time. I suspect it will, because it's that good. And Lagodi certainly has influenced other writers. So I think he's got a good shot of becoming a classic writer. But... I'm not for sure about that because other writers who definitely should be published as classics everywhere by every reprint house, every, anywhere, every reprint house should be publishing Robert E. Howard as a classic writer because he's fantastic, fantastic, a great writer, magnificent, who wrote very important stuff because his writings have been very influential. Penguin did do this, but in America, no Black Spine classic. We did a, get a Black Spine classic of The Mysteries of Paris by Eugene Sue, which is cool. It's gigantic. It's cool that they did this, but they probably, if they're going to do this, why don't you do like a gigantic volume of Robert E. Howard, who by all accounts is a better writer. I haven't read this. This is kind of a penny dreadful kind of thing. And so why don't, don't they have a Black Spine Classics of Varney the Vampire if they're going to have this? I don't know. Is this more classic than Varney the Vampire? Varney the Vampire would disagree. 
And is this going to still be a classic in 10 or 15 years? Or will it be pruned away and put in the vaults? I don't know. Roger spends a lot of time in the vaults and he says it's fine, but it does make you wonder. Literary classics or are they? That's all I have for you today. I will catch you next time.